Throughout North America and Asia throughout the lattermost part of the late Cretaceous period, a dynasty of large carnivores had become the top predators in their ecosystems. Beginning in the Jurassic and early Cretaceous as fairly small predators present throughout the Northern Hemisphere that would have probably fed on small mammals and reptiles, living in ecosystems where allosauroids were the top predators. From around 125 million years ago, members of this group, the Tyrannosauroidea, began to get much larger and take up the niche of top predator in their ecosystem, particularly in China. But elsewhere, they were kept in their place by much larger predators. It wasn't really until sometime between 90 and 82 million years ago that large tyrannosauroids began to take center stage in the rest of Asia and in North America, after the allosauroids mysteriously died out, leaving voids open for new top predators. By the end of the Cretaceous period, only one lineage, the Tyrannosauridae family, was present as the top predators of Eastern Asia and throughout most of North America, with Tyrannosaurus rex seemingly ruling the entire western subcontinent of Laramidia, with the possible exception of the cold far north. But in the eastern subcontinent of Appalachia, where the western interior seaway had prevented Tyrannosaurids from entering, there was no T-Rex and no Tyrannosauridae. In their place, slightly more primitive Tyrannosaurids, whose ancestors were cut off from the ancestors of Tyrannosaurids when the Western Interior Seaway broke through, reached fairly large sizes, though we know relatively little about them and their ecosystems. In the final stage of the Cretaceous, there was Dryptosaurus of Charles R. Knight's iconic Leaping Laylapse painting. Though before Dryptosaurus, in the second to last stage of the Cretaceous, known as the Campanian, a different tyrant lizard was king of the east. A creature that would 77 million years later become known to science as Appalachiosaurus. At this stage, Appalachia was completely cut off from Laramidia, and its animals and plants were therefore evolving separately. Despite this, based on the most recent phylogenetic analysis prevented in Darren Nation and Andrea Cow's study on the osteology of the British Tyrannosauroid Eotyrannus, as well as a series of other phylogenetic studies that we'll be addressing later in this video, Appalachiosaurus was actually more closely related to the Tyrannosaurids than to Dryptosaurus, being more derived than Dryptosaurus, but more primitive than the Tyrannosaurids. This fact indicates that there were two lineages of fairly large Tyrannosauroids living in Appalachia at the end of the Cretaceous. At the moment, we only have these two species, and don't really know much about the evolutionary history of these groups, nor do we know when or why the North American ecosystem changed from allosauroids being the top predators to tyrannosauroids. While these lineages of tyrannosauroids were evolving in Appalachia, their close relatives the tyrannosaurids diversified into two main lineages, the more gracile Albertosaurines and the more robust Tyrannosaurines, the latter of which spread from Laramidia into Asia when sea levels created land bridges between the two during the late Campanian stage. The skeleton that would become the holotype of Appalachiosaurus was discovered in 1982 in Montgomery County, Alabama, in calcareous clays that form part of what is called the turnip seed dinosaur bone bed in the Arcola limestone member of the Moorville formation. 
The bones were first discussed in a 1988 paper by Dr. David King, no relation to me, and his colleagues in the Journal of the Alabama Academy of Science. The fossil was discovered by David King and Janet Abbott King, whom one website says is his wife, though I haven't been able to verify this, though it is certainly very plausible given their surnames. Anyway, these two found the fossil in a road cutting adjacent to a highway, and were given permission to hunt for fossils on the site by local landowner Sidney Turnipseed, for whom this bone bed was named. David King and colleagues interpreted Appalachiosaurus as a Tyrannosaur rid, but didn't formally describe it in their paper. The skeleton was made of parts of the skull, some teeth, and parts of the pelvis, hind limbs, ribs, and some pale vertebrae. And here's a nice little illustration by Thomas Carr, showing the skeleton, with the areas in white being the material that we know we have, and the areas in grey being the material that's missing. And here's a little drawing of what the skeleton looked like in situ in the rock layer, which appeared in the original paper by David King et al. Now, Appalachiosaurus's skeleton was deposited in a shallow marine environment, but that doesn't mean that the animal was swimming out to sea. Instead, David King and colleagues noted that the sedimentology of the turnip seed bone bed is consistent with a significant storm event, indicating that the animal was torn away from the land by a large storm surge and dragged out to sea where it drowned and was quickly buried. After King et al. reported the specimen, it was many years before it received a scientific description. After a few studies in the 1990s briefly touched on the bones and assigned them to Albertosaurus, uh, this ID was first given to them by paleontologist David Lamb in 1989, um, it wasn't really until 2004 when we got a pretty decent discussion of them by paleontologist Thomas Holtz in a chapter of the second edition of the book The Dinosauria, edited by David Weishampel and colleagues. Holtz ran a phylogenetic analysis of the specimen, and concluded that it was an Albertosaurine tyrannosaurid, closely related to Albertosaurus and Gorgosaurus. Though he also noted that the row of six ridges on the top of the snout was similar to the Tyrannosaurine Allioramus. Holtz's paper noted that another then upcoming study by Carr et al. had instead reported the specimen as lying outside the Tyrannosauridae family. And on that note, let's talk about that Carr et al. study, since that is the study which first formally properly described Appalachiosaurus and gave it the name Appalachiosaurus. The name Appalachiosaurus montgomeriensis is, to be honest, probably one of the least imaginative dinosaur names I've ever seen in terms of etymology, since the genus name literally just means lizard from Appalachia, and the species name montgomeriensis just means from Montgomery, since the turnip seed bone bed is in Montgomery County. That said, I still think it's a pretty good sounding name, even if it's pretty basic in terms of what it's named after. Now that we have this description, let's have a little look at some of Appalachiosaurus's skull bones. Now, the skull of Appalachiosaurus contains a number of features which indicate that it's a tyrannosauroid, but not a tyrannosaur rid, as the prior studies had concluded. First, if we look at the nasal bones, we can see a number of bony bumps on top, which are present in a lot of Tyrannosauroids, including Tyrannosaur rids. Uh, in fact, Carr et al. did find this bone to be very similar to Albertosaurus. But unlike Albertosaurus or any Tyrannosaur rids, it didn't possess any bony papillae on its upper surface, which would indicate that it didn't have the armoured skin over the top of its head. Um, such as is shown in this illustration of the skin types of the Tyrannosaurid Daspletosaurus by Dino Pulera. 
which also basically means that the drawing I've been showing you by me throughout this video is probably wrong. Anyway, uh, the study also noted that the maxillary fenestra, that is this hole in Appalachiosaurus's maxilla, which is the big bone on the side of the skull, was about twice as high up in the maxilla as it is in Tyrannosaurids. Uh, as you can see in this handy little comparison of Tyrannosaurids plus Appalachiosaurus's maxillae. Now, the reason I'm going on about the maxilla, in addition to this feature which seems to distinguish it from the Tyrannosaurids, is that it also has some features which tell us that the type specimen of Appalachiosaurus was probably a subadult or maybe even a juvenile. These features include the narrow nature of the bone, the flat lateral surface of the interfenestral strut, the ridge around the antorbital fenestra, the circular shape of the maxillary fenestra, and a whole bunch of other features which the paper goes into, but I feel like if I spend too much time talking about specific bone features and what they mean, I will bore you to tears, and bore myself to tears, so I'm just going to talk about another little interesting feature which is briefly touched upon in the paper, that being that two of the animal's tail vertebrae were found to have been fused together, which the authors indicated was probably the result of an injury with the two bones then healing into one another after they were broken. Anyway, since I don't want to bore you tremendously by talking about detailed skeletal features, I've attached a link to the paper in the description so you can read all of that technical stuff, uh, especially since I know plenty of you will be interested in that technical stuff. Um, interestingly, the first partial skeleton of Appalachiosaurus that we've just talked about might not be the only remains that we have of Appalachiosaurus, since there's actually quite a lot of Tyrannosaur material from across the eastern United States, in the Santonian and Campanian, which has historically been thought to represent Albertosaurus, but which Sandy Ebersole and James King suggest in this 2011 paper might all actually belong to Appalachiosaurus. This would indicate that Appalachiosaurus was a very successful, very wide-ranging predator for a pretty long time. In this 2018 paper by Chase D. Brownstein, there's further notes that we have very similar metatarsal bones to those assigned to Appalachiosaurus from the much older Woodbine formation from the Cenomanian dating to around 96 million years ago. This means that a lineage of Appalachiosaurus-like predators might have been at the top of the food chain in Appalachia for at least 19 million years, making the group highly successful. Now, the arms of Appalachiosaurus are a mystery. Lying outside of the Tyrannosauridae, we can't really say with absolute confidence how many fingers it had, since large non-Tyrannosaurid Tyrannosaurs elsewhere have had quite large muscular arms with three-fingered hands. But Appalachiosaurus was quite a lot more closely related to Tyrannosaurids than they were, so sometimes we'll see Appalachiosaurus reconstructed with three digits and sometimes even quite long arms, and sometimes we'll see it reconstructed with two digits and often quite short arms. That said, there is reason to believe that Appalachiosaurus is much more likely to have had two digits than three digits, and that reason comes from Dryptosaurus. You see, based on phylogeny, Dryptosaurus is more primitive than Appalachiosaurus, but much more closely related to it than all of the Tyrannosaurs we know definitively had three fingers. So, there's very good reason to believe that Appalachiosaurus was descended from an ancestor similar to Dryptosaurus. And, there's also good reason to believe that Dryptosaurus probably only had three fingers. Probably only had two fingers. How did I say three when there's two there? Goodness. As Steve Brusatti et al. point out in this 2011 paper on the anatomy of Dryptosaurus, which I've linked in the description, the finger bones of Dryptosaurus, in particular the ungual phalanx, uh, i.e. the pointy claw bone, 
are notably more similar to those of two-fingered tyrannosaurids than to more basal tyrannosauroids. So from that, we can say that if Dryptosaurus probably had two fingers, then unless Tyrannosaurs independently evolved to have two fingers on multiple occasions, it, it's a pretty safe bet that Appalachiosaurus also only had two fingers. The Appalachiosaurus holotype was about 6.5 meters long, though as mentioned earlier, there's good reason to believe it was only a juvenile. It's plausible that adults may have been a lot larger, but until more material shows up, we don't really know how big the adults got, and I haven't been able to find any estimates in the published literature. On to talking about the ecology of Appalachiosaurus. Again, sadly we don't know that much. Uh, we have evidence for possible pack hunting in the Tyrannosaur Rid Albertosaurus, so we can't say that complex social dynamics and family relationships are necessarily off the table for this species. It's likely that Appalachiosaurus was the apex terrestrial predator of an ecosystem that would likely have contained an assortment of other dinosaurs that we have remains of from the Santonian and Campanian of Appalachia, though they may have also shared this top predator niche with Dryptosaurids. Herbivores that would have lived alongside them include hadrosaurs, leptoceratopsids, ankylosaurs, and ornithomimosaurs, with omnivorous troodontids also probably being present. The Campanian of Appalachia contained a significant diversity of birds, including the weird primitive flightless seabirds in the Hesperornithidae family, as well as a host of enantionothemes. I call Appalachiosaurus the top predator of the terrestrial ecosystem here, because where it meets the aquatic environment, it it shared its environment with um with Dinosuchus. And something tells me that Appalachiosaurus is probably not going to win a fight against a colossal alligator relative that could have reached up to 10 meters long and weighed almost two and a half tons. So anyway, that was Appalachiosaurus. Much of its ecology and the vast majority of what it lived alongside are a total mystery right now, and hopefully more fossils from the late Cretaceous of Appalachia will help us fill in the gaps of this once great island landmass, what evolved there, and how different life became in the east from the much more well-known and well-understood west. And I also hope that much more is learned about Appalachiosaurus in the future. I hope you enjoyed this video and want to learn more about our planet, the life that once inhabited it, and a whole host of topics around geology, paleontology, climate, and biology. Please give us a subscribe and a like if you enjoyed this video, and let me know what you thought in the comments below. This video was a special get well soon gift to my friend Mel, who's currently dealing with some stuff, so please wish her well in the comments if you get this far, and I'll pass that on to her. Remember that you can support the channel on Patreon, and Patreon supporters got this video one day early. Huge thank you to those supporters, Jan and Eric Feenstra. Your support is hugely appreciated. In future videos, you'll be able to vote on what the next video will be, vote on PaleoArt, get early access to my videos, and all that fun stuff. That said, this week I won't be doing a vote on the next video, since I'm already working on a whole bunch at the same time, and want to get them out quickly. In theory, in a couple of weeks time, I'll be posting my review of the scientific accuracy of the dinosaurs and environments in the movie 65 after which we'll be talking about Dakota Raptor, the dinosaur that didn't exist. Then we'll be getting back to the prehistoric planet reviews, and probably posting a few other videos in the meantime um, about climate related topics, um, and about um, environmental science related topics as they, uh, as they come out. But again, you guys will have the opportunity to vote on what you want to see. In any case, I thank you again for watching, I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day, and see you soon!